Thank you. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak here. So, <coughs> so this is, uh, I forgot to write that down because I was in a hurry, but this is uh, joint work with Colin Guillermo. And then part of it, uh, namely the part concerning uh, dynamical zeta functions, is based on the previous joint work with Maciek Zworski. So <clears throat> let me start. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, polycotrial resonances, which are associated to strongly chaotic, in the sense of hyperbolic, dynamical systems. And uh, <clears throat> I will mostly concentrate on this joint work with Colin Guillermo, which handles the case of open systems in contrast with some of the compact or closed or unossive systems that were considered before. So, <clears throat> so let me first start before giving a definition of a hyperbolic dynamical system. Let, let me start with a basic example of a situation in which the results apply. So here's an example. Let's consider an Riemannian manifold, it's negatively curved, negative sectional curvature, and it's asymptotically hyperbolic. So it has some kind of big ends where, so for example, one example is this pair of, uh, I don't know what anymore, but the point is once you hit a certain threshold, you do not come back how only geodesics. Now, uh, the dynamical system that I will consider is the geodesic flow. So this is a flow on the unit tangent bundle, or if you want cotangent bundle by duality, of this manifold. So it's a smooth flow. And now, uh, one feature that you want to study about this flow, well, you want to study long time behavior of this flow, and one way to capture the statistics of long time behavior is through correlations and the study of mixing. So if I have two functions, and I will, in this talk, require them to be very smooth. Of course, this can be reduced, but it cannot be pulled down all the way to L2, so I might as well just consider smooth in this talk. Then I can define the correlation of these two functions, depending on time, which is just the integral of f over sm propagated forward for time t along the flow. So this composition propagates the support forward, multiplied by this function g, and integrated with respect to, well, here we have a natural Liouville measure. In general, you don't need an invariant measure to make this work. You can let g be a density, and later we'll write an operator. It doesn't depend really on having any natural smooth measure on the space. So what you do is you have two functions here. Of course, I'm going to cheat, and now I'm going to pretend that this is the sphere bundle of the same manifold, which is really where the geodesic flow lives. So you have two functions, f and g. And because the flow is chaotic, what's going to happen is that this function f, as you propagate it forward, it will spread out. So it will become something very ragged, like that. So it should spread out along the unstable directions, as we'll see. And ow. Sorry, I'm just I'm marveling at the, the technology. Uh, and so it will, in some sense, be everywhere. And so this correlation should exhibit some convergence properties as time goes to infinity that don't depend actually much on where f and g were in the first place. Somehow, as time goes to infinity, the properties of our dynamical system really become uniform. Now, uh, so one, uh, well, you could, you could of course study the limit of this thing, and that's something we know is mixing, but you can try to understand better what for example, what kind of error term you have in the limit, or what kind of maybe other terms you can have in, expand, you know, in an expansion of this guy as t goes to plus infinity. So one way to uh, study these things is to take the Laplace transform. So this is rho of g hat of lambda. Still readable down here? OK. So what I do is I just take the, well, I just take the Laplace transform.
And this is defined for positive real parts. So my convention resonances ultimately will be that they lie at the left half plane. So you see that if real part of lambda is bigger than zero, this converges exponentially because this guy is bounded. And so you get a nice holomorphic function. And what is to be expected is that long time properties of this expression depend on our ability to meromorphically continue the Laplace transform to the entire complex plane. Somehow the farther we are able to continue it, and the more we know about the poles there, how the better asymptotics we can get. And how the size of the strip where you continue it corresponds directly with the size of exponential remainder in the asymptotics. So that's a theorem. So this I'm gonna call this theorem zero. So in the form presented here, say for the non-compact case, it was uh, proved by myself and Kulen Guillermo in 14, but of course there is, as I will point out later, a long study of tradition of these things. We weren't exactly the first people to write you know, the geodesic flow. Uh, and the theorem is, uh, well, very easy. It's just rho hat of g of lambda continues meromorphically to the entire complex plane. And the poles of this continuation are known as polycot ruel resonances. All right, so that's the theorem. And then, uh, well, uh, let me talk a little bit more, just a tiny bit more about how this statement is useful. So this has been presented uh, a few times already, in particular in talks regarding spectral gaps. But morally speaking, this statement in itself doesn't give you much in terms of long time behavior. What you have to do is you have to look at this lambda plane and locate where is your first pole, first from the right. And then if you're lucky enough, and that actually happens in uh, most situations, you will have a simple pole and no other poles on this vertical line. And then you will know that this correlation behaves like e to the lambda zero t, so this is an open system, which means that energy you can escape. So this correlation you would, if it's really an open system, you expect it to exponentially decay, times the integral of f with respect to some measure, which is in this case typically a fractal measure, integral of g with respect to some other measure, plus O little of one, like that. And these measures can also be identified later from the residue of this meromorphic continuation. Now, you might get more lucky and you might be able to prove that you actually have a whole gap here after the first pole. And then if the gap has size epsilon, then you can replace this by an exponentially small remainder. You, you need a somewhat stronger property. You need to really estimate whatever operator you have in this gap, but morally that is why we are looking for these extensions and why we want to understand the poles to a large extent. Okay, so in this talk today, I'm not going to talk about spectral gaps. That's why in these diagrams there, they're in yellow. So I'm not going to present any results related to spectral gaps. I will only present results related to meromorphic continuations of things. Okay, so now, <clears throat> well, how do we treat this problem in general? Where if we have a non-compact manifold, here's one observation. So let's say we take a large convex set, say in our sphere bundle. If it's large enough and un under this asymptotical hyperbolic assumption, some kind of control on ends, because this is not Laplacian, so somehow what precisely happens at the ends doesn't matter as long as it doesn't come back. So if we take a large enough convex set, we see that uh, we have these parts of F which lie on trajectories which escape, and then once these trajectories escape far enough, they get out of this convex set, and they will never come back. And if uh, the set is large enough so that it contains the support of G, our correlation just never gonna see them. 
Somehow, once our uh, function, we propagate it, the part that escaped past a certain threshold, we don't care what happens to it. So it turns out to be more convenient to forget about that part completely, because it's not very relevant what precisely happens there, and just consider a flow on a domain with boundary, where a flow is allowed to escape through the boundary and you assume it never comes back. And so that's something that uh, brings us to our setup, which I will put here. <clears throat> so the general situation that we will consider, we will consider a compact manifold with boundary. So there it would just be the sphere bundle of a large compact, stri strictly convex set. Then we're going to consider this flow <coughs> some smooth flow on this compact manifold with boundary. And it has this generator, which will be very important. So this generator is a vector field on our compact manifold with boundary. And the flow is allowed to escape. So it's not defined on the manifold after some time, depending on the point. Now, uh, how do I quantify this assumption that we never come back? Well, I just require that the boundary is strictly convex. And I'm just going to draw a picture. If we extend the flow a little bit past the boundary, then the trajectories that are touching the boundary should look like that. So this is OK. And trajectories that look like this are not OK. It's a second derivative condition. Now, once you have this, what you can do is you can see that really the dynamics of this flow is controlled by trajectories which are trapped. Somehow, if every trajectory escapes in finite time, your correlation is just zero eventually. So what you have to study is you have to study these sets of trajectories which are trapped in positive or negative time direction. And I can view it like that. So these are just uh, trajectories that are gamma plus are trajectories that are trapped backwards. Gamma minus are trajectories that are trapped forward. And their intersection are trajectories that are trapped forward and backward. And that's something called a trapped set. And this strictly convexity assumption shows us that it's actually compactly inside our domain. So I should make also one comment that's important for the techniques of the problem. And I think I'll probably get a question or two about that. That uh, what we really do is we take our manifold and we embed it into a compact manifold without boundary. Topologically, you can always do that. We extend the flow in a somewhat arbitrary fashion, but just a little bit past the boundary, we're going to kill our flow by multiplying by a function that just vanishes on the surface, so that we really have a flow on a compact manifold that never comes back. So that's somehow the analytical setting is going to be there. And then the flow is well defined for all times, and that's a well, you know, meaningful expression. Now. The key assumption that we're going to make is uh, the fact that the flow is chaotic or hyperbolic in our definition. So we assume that the set case is hyperbolic. And what this means is that for each point in K, the tangent space at this point decomposes into flow direction, stable direction, and unstable direction, where this is just one-dimensional space generated by the generator of the flow. And then these two guys, they have this property that if I take the differential of the flow for a long time and I apply it to some vector, it's going to decay exponentially. So here theta is a positive constant. If I took a vector in the stable space, and I propagated for positive times, or I took a vector from unstable space, and I propagated for negative times. So you must have all seen the dense, copyrighted by uh, Maciek Zworski, used without permission, that you have a flow direction where you just flow like this, then you have the stable direction where you compress in forward times, and you have the unstable direction where you compress exponentially in backward times. So that's a natural definition. One more thing I should say about this setup is that this includes the case where the boundary is empty. So we just have a compact manifold without boundary. So then there is no way of escaping. So when I say escaping, it just means I cross the boundary. So then this is exactly what's known as an OSA flow. 
So sometimes when I refer to compact situation, I will just refer to an OSA flow. Now the general case, it's very closely related. The difference is, uh, in my opinion, more technical, and we are, have some work in progress to really remove this difference uh, entirely. The general case is related to something called an axiom A basic set. OK, so just for a dynamicist and the audience, that's really very, very close uh, to the setting that we consider. <coughs> OK. So now, um, let me present some theorems about this setup. So the first theorem is just going to be about meromorphic continuation of correlations again. But it's a bit of a nuisance that these correlations depend on f and g. Of course, they depend linearly, so you know that what you really ought to be continuing is some operator. And surely enough, if we look at a correlation, we take the Laplace transform, what do we get? Well. We get this, the integral e to the minus lambda t times to the minus t x f and g dt. So I just rewrote my correlation. And I replaced my pullback operator by the evolution group of this vector field. So another thing that's going to be quite important in the uh, philosophy of um, how these things work here is that uh, this vector field, you can view it as a first-order differential operator. It acts on smooth functions, so you can associate function analytical objects to it, such as, for example, the evolution group. OK. <clears throat> so now you see that this is, if I integrate it and real part of lambda is bigger than 0, so the integral converges, this is really just the same as taking uh, f and g and pairing them by this operator r of lambda where r of lambda is just this integral, e to the minus t x plus lambda dt. So I just integrated this operator. That's, that's a well-defined operation for, on, on smooth functions where r of lambda bigger than 0. And you can also view it, say, if we have an invariant measure, then you can view it as the resolvent of this anti self adjoint operator on L2. Again, in one half plane. OK. <laughs> so that's the object. And then the theorem, so theorem one, I'm not sure. Maybe I should just erase this, actually. So a better statement of this theorem is that this family of operators continues meromorphically to the entire complex plane. But of course, we cannot do it on L2 because the L2 resolvent is unique and the, you know, we have continuous spectrum here. So we need to, as is common in scattering theory, relax our mapping assumptions. And here we are going to assume that it maps from C0 infinity functions on U to distributions on U. So with not necessarily with compact support. As I said, this, this can be you know, strengthened, but this really means that we are continuing the Schwartz kernel. OK, all right. So now, um, and I should say, well, it continues meromorphical is a family of operators there with poles of finite rank. So it's kind of a somewhat nice and expected situation. All right. Mm -hmm. OK, <clears throat> so now uh, let me present another result before I go to explaining how you prove these things. And this result is a perhaps a original, actually more common way to define resonances, because this is a family of operators, and pe people often don't like operators, and what's an operator? So uh, a more common thing back in the day was to study zeta functions. So that's a function, and continuing a function seems less mysterious, even though it's really no easier. So here I can define a real zeta function for this guy. And for that, I take this. Let me first write out the product. Now let me say what it is. So I take a product over all primitive closed trajectories of the flow. Oh, they are all on the trapped set, of course, because they are trapped. And so this t gamma is the period of this trajectory. So this has a, this uh, 
thing you can see for hyperbolic flows converges for sufficiently large real parts of lambda. And then, ow, sorry. And it has at least a formal analogy with the Riemann zeta function if you put logs of prime numbers here. So analogously to the Riemann zeta function, analogously to what I discussed before, the first pole of this meromorphic continuation that we will obtain, so let me first, I guess, say the theorem. So the theorem is, uh, well, there are some assumptions. Assume that the stable and unstable things are orientable. It's a technical condition, but nevertheless. Then this real zeta function continues meromorphically to the entire complex plane. And then you expect, and that, that has turned out to be true, that the first pole of this guy, here it actually sits at the topological entropy, so the resonances are somewhat different here. And then it is known that there are no resonances here, so just like with the uh, theorem of Adamar and lavalet poussin that gives you a bound on the number of primitive trajectories up to some time, and this is just e to the, let me just, I hope I don't get it wrong, one plus O little of one as t goes to infinity. So that's something called as a prime geodesic theorem. And once again, if you obtain a spectral gap, then you would be able to push this to an exponentially good remainder. So that would be, I guess, the analog of a Riemann hypothesis for this thing. Of course, uh, there's no dynamical system so that this is the Riemann zeta function, so it's a somewhat formal analogy, but nevertheless. Uh, well, I should say about this theorem, I will, I will address history just uh, in a moment, but this theorem, it was conjectured by Smail. In some setting, I actually read the paper of Smail, and neither of these papers really resolved the conjecture, but on the other hand, the conjecture was weaker than something. So morally speaking, it was conjectured by Smail. And then it was resolved for an Ossoff case by Giulietti, Leverani, and Polycott, uh, I think two years ago, and two, three years ago, 2012. And then myself and uh, Maciek Zworski provided a different proof somewhat later based on the microlocal strategy that I'm gonna talk about. And uh, uh, myself and Guillermo did this for the uh, general axiom A-ish case. Okay, so those are the uh, results. So um, let me see. Ta -ta, ta -ta. Right, and I also I should say that uh, well, this isn't very relevant to this talk, but the, this gap, this uh, bound was first proved by different methods by Grigory Margulis. Okay, <clears throat> so now uh, now we can take a look at this diagram while I'm talking. So here we see these two results, meromorphic continuations. Then you see that if you have spectral gaps. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, as we know. Then you can uh, expand these results to get exponential decay of correlations and exponential remainders in prime geodesic theorem. And the ingredients for the proofs that we provide are uh, tools that were really originally used in scattering theory, like in Euclidean scattering, and developed by the microlocal school. So those are the uh, uh, propagation estimates of Hermander and Melrose. Uh, the trace formula of Atiyah, Bonn, and Gilliman is used for zeta functions. And this is all tied together to the setting of dynamical systems in a beautiful paper by Foren Schostrand in 2011 where they interpreted the, uh, an, an Anosa flow, a dynamical system, as a scattering problem. And our approach, to a large extent, is, uh, you know, draws or is inspired by this work. Okay. So now, uh, speaking about previous work, I have a list here. So this, uh, these problems have been studied for a long time, and there were several schools of people, several philosophies to somehow to obtain meromorphic continuation, also to obtain gaps. So kind of the oldest school is, uh, did it using transfer operators that we've seen uh, quite a bit in this conference. And so it was done in various settings, I guess in increasing generality, one hopes by Ruel, Polycott, Rue, Fried, and uh, Perry Polycott. I have an asterisk book where it's uh, very nicely explained how this approach works. 
Then the next line of thought was to, instead of conjugating your system to some transfer operator, which is somewhat arbitrary, selective, there are a lot of choices there, what you can do is you can really think of your, of your family of operators that you want to continue as a true resolvent of the generator of the flow. This is this first order differential operator, but you have to change the space. You cannot do it on L2, so you can do it on something that's called anisotropic Sobolev space. So I'm not going to go into details how these are constructed because I'll run out of time before then. So let me say now an anisotropic Sobolev space is just a space that's constructed using microlocal techniques typically and it assigns, uh, you know, it requires different Sobolev regularity, not only different points in, uh, in your base manifold, but also in different frequencies. Now if you Fourier transform a function, say on Rn, you know that being in a Sobolev space means that the uh, you know, that the function, the Fourier transform decays sufficiently fast. But you can ask for different rates of decay in different directions. And then you can make this on a manifold, and that becomes an anisotropic Sobolev space. So the, the, there is a well-developed theory to handle these that has been, again, developed by, for other problems. Okay. And so this approach has been uh, developed, well, there were already some uh, ideas about these uh, spaces in the work of Kitaev. And then uh, there were papers by Blankeller Liverani, Liverani, Gözel Liverani, Baladi Tsuji, Butterly Liverani, and the paper of Giulietti Liverani and Polycott that I mentioned before. And uh, I should also say some, some of them apply to the setting of diffeomorphisms rather than flows. That also explains the number of papers. Now, finally, the approach that we're going to take is the one that I uh, already hinted at, and that's the approach that was started in uh, the papers for Roy-Chostrand and for Chostrand. And this is to interpret, to still study, the, to still use this anisotropic space, but to prove analytic properties on the space of this operator using scattering theory and microlocal analysis. And this led to a variety of results that seem to have been unattainable using previous approaches, such as, uh, well, there were some results on counting by uh, myself, Kirill Dachev and Maciek Zvorsky, and uh, Maciek Zvorsky and I had a couple of papers on the zeta function and on the uh, viscosity limits that uh, was mentioned on Monday. And then there are results of Ford Tsuji, which really explore for contact case the very precise asymptotic and the structure of these resonances. Uh, there is a paper of uh, Myself, for and Guillaume move that addresses the constant curvature case in higher dimensions. And finally, there is a recent paper of Jens Worski that shows that the essential spectral gap cannot be too big. So some of there, are, there are resonances somewhere, not too far away. So as you can see, there are a lot of possible applications that this approach can produce. And also, there have been recent interesting applications by Colin Guillaume to inverse problems, uh, more precisely, lens rigidity problems in, uh, I inverse geometric problems, okay. And finally, I should mention people who worked on spectral gaps, even though I'm not going to present any spectral gaps results, and that, of course, the classical result of Dolgopet Liverani uh, on the spectral gaps for contact on also flows, or some of the more general on also flows, and then it was improved by Tsuji to locate really the size of the essential spectral gap, and Nonan Marshersworski gave a microlocal interpretation extension of uh, this result. And in the XTM A case, there are, of course, papers by Federic Noy in the constant curvature case for surfaces, and Luchazar Stoyanov later extended this for, to, to, to several other XTM A systems. Okay, I think my sheet is done. <coughs> All right, <coughs> so we're exactly uh, <coughs> at the right time for me to present uh, this uh, microlocal setup that I have been talking about. So here's what we're going to do. Well, so what we really need is we need a meromorphic continuation of this resolvent. For that, so for that, so I'm proving theorem one now. I'm explaining theorem one now. So get this meromorphic continuation by standard Fredholm theory. It's enough to show that this operator from its domain to this anisotropic space that you have to construct specifically for the problem, and I should also say this only goes strip by strip, so somehow the order of the space has to be much larger than negative real part of lambda. That's a technical thing, but nevertheless important. 
<coughs> so it's enough to prove that this operator is fret home. Then the analytic fret home theory gives you a discrete spectrum. That's essentially what we're looking for here. Now, well, how do we know to prove that an operator is fret home? Well, we can show that uh, we can try to show that a compact perturbation of this operator is invertible. So what's really enough to show is that if I take, uh, well, let me first try it like that, x plus lambda, and then uh, I will put it in this form for reasons to be explained later, minus some iq, again, this guy like that, is invertible. And q is a compact operator. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> that of course, this plus uh, some use of functional analysis shows that we just have to prove an estimate for this operator. And that's what we're going to do for the rest of the talk. So estimates is finally you know, analysis. That's something that we, we can attack with analysis, you know, prove an estimate. Uh, it turns out that it's convenient to actually rescale the whole situation by a small parameter. It might seem somewhat artificial at first, but I'm going to introduce a very small parameter I call h. I think it, it, it appeared at the last talk. It's the same h, uh, well, with some changes, <laughs> suppose. And so what you really want is you want to say, put an operator p here, where p is just h over i x uh, plus lambda, like that. And then you want to show the following estimate that if u is an hr and f is the right-hand side, p minus i q u, then the norm of u in this space can be estimated by the norm of the right-hand side if h is small enough. And the way for me to conveniently write that, so this constants again, this is just what pops up from analysis. So it's, I could have put h to the minus 2 here and still would get the correct argument, but that's what pops up. And plus, you can, because h is small enough, and that's where it's convenient, you can spare an h infinity remainder sum fast, faster than every power of h. So that's the form in which our semi-classical estimates will be. That's why I write it this way. Then if h is small enough, then you can remove this remainder, you get invertibility. I should say, in this talk, we only consider questions of meromorphic continuation, which means that our lambda is fixed in some compact set, might be large, and then we choose h small enough depending on this set, and just fix it. For some applications such as spectral gaps, what's more convenient is to really let h go to zero, and, but that, 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 that would require more analysis in a regime that we do not consider here. However, I should say that our methods would easily cater to prove such a statement if the essential component near the trapped set is somehow obtained. Okay. All right. So somehow it's not just a meromorphic continuation statement, it also gives you a framework to work in. So let me drag this up. So that's uh, the estimate that we're trying to prove. Now what we really want to do now is we want to use a uh, Semi-classical analysis. So this is a differential equation, partial differential equation. And I'm going to skip an introduction to semi-classical analysis here for lack of time. So I'll just write things. So you can view this differential operator as a semi-classical quantization of a certain function. So this d is 1 over id. So there is a whole theory that lets you, that explains how you can do this. And this function is a smooth function on the cotangent bundle of our manifold. And in fact, for this specific differential operator, this function is not very hard. It's just linear in the fibers of the cotangent bundle. So just you take psi and then you pair it. So psi is a covector. Here you pair it with the, ten, you know, with the flow generator at x. So that's this linear function. And then I should say immediately what my Q is going to be. So the Q is going to depend on H, which is okay because we just need invertibility modulo compact. So Q would be also a quantization of some guy. But here, the symbol here would be compactly supported on the cotangent bundle. 
And when you quantize a compactly supported symbol, you get a smoothing operator, which is compact on all of these spaces. And I should say these spaces are not very crazy. They include smooth functions, and they are included in distributions. So it's really just Sobolev space of varying order. Now, <clears throat> what you want to do in order to prove your estimate is, uh, well, this semi-classical analysis strategy comes from the classical quantum correspondence. So you view this function as a classical observable or a classical Hamiltonian. And then you view your problem as see, looking for eigenstates of your quantum Hamiltonian, which is the operator. And what this correspondence tells you is that you have to look your, somehow the interesting parts of your dynamics will only be localized on the energy surface, so places where this symbol vanishes. And that's, by the way, that's the place where uh, it's, it's well known that flows are harder than diffeos, but in the microlocal understanding, the fact that you localize here tells me that it's not actually any different. Somehow, once you, once you localize to the surface, you remove the flow direction effectively from your problem. And you have to look at the dynamics of the classical Hamiltonian flow, so the Hamiltonian flow of this symbol on this energy surface. And if you understand this well enough, then you can prove an estimate. That, that's, a, that's a general strategy. It applies, you know, originally applied to things like wave equation, Schrodinger equation. It's nice that you can apply it here. So we better look at the picture of this flow. Of course, since our flow was hyperbolic, on the trapped set, we see that the cotangent space also has a stable, unstable decomposition. Is it visible like that? It's not too small? Okay. <laughs> Just by duality of the original stable, unstable decomposition. And you can see from the definition of this guy that P equals zero is just the graph of this dual stable plus unstable bundles. You remove the flow direction because this is, this is just a linear equation here in Xi. So it just gives you a hy hyperspace at each point. Okay. Now, uh, let me attempt to draw this flow. Well, you can see that this guy, unlike many problems, say, for Laplacians, this energy surface is not compact in the cotangent space. It's a hyperplane, so it reaches the infinity in the cotangent space. And so in order to handle this easily, we introduce something called fiber radially compactified cotangent bundle, which scared uh, more than one person, more than maybe a dozen people away from microlocal analysis. But it's really, you just, just draw a ball. And the inside of a ball is your cotangent space. And the boundary of the ball is infinity, so in some sense you projectivize. So the boundary here corresponds to the infinite values of the frequency, and there is an easy way to embed you know, whole contingent space in this ball so that the distance to the boundary of the ball is just absolute value xi inverse. So that's this just it. So now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a dynamics of this guy over the trapped set. And that's really following somehow what, uh, you know, th this is really the, the four Shostron picture because for an OSA flow, that's the only thing you have. So of course you have your zero here. Oh, and I forgot to draw my flow. So the Hamiltonian flow, well, it acts on the base point in a natural way by the original flow. And it acts on xi linearly in the only way possible geometrically, namely minus transpose, because those are cotangent vectors. And then this is chosen so that this guy exactly, you know, expands and contracts the spaces correctly. So now, <coughs> okay, so here we have the zero section. So what I'm doing is I'm drawing really a fiber radially compactified, well, just a fiber of that. So I just fix my x, I forget about my flow in x, I, See what happens in Xi, because that's where interesting things happen for now. So I have the zero section, and that's of course unchanged, because Xi equals zero is unchanged by this flow, and that's what would be the trapped set in that situation. But what we're going to do is we're going to put our bump here, so we're going to dampen it immediately, and that's going to be our compactly supported symbol here, which makes our whole situation invertible. Now, well, what happens if we consider a generic vector 
Well, if we go forward, if this vector had some non-zero unstable component, it will, the length will go to infinity, so it will go to the boundary of this fiber radially compactified thing. And the, the angle of the vector will converge towards the unstable manifold, because the stable component will go to zero, the unstable component will go to infinity. So I can also say that if you go backwards, same thing will happen with converging to the stable manifold and again to infinite lengths. So here I can draw these two points, EU star and ES star, on the infinity of the fibers, and a generic trajectory would look like that. And then there are some special trajectories which correspond to situations when either stable or unstable component of your vector field was equal to zero, of your vector was equal, covector was equal to zero. So that's, that's the dynamics of the flow. And what we see in this dynamics is we have this trap set, which we have forgot about basically by damping it. And then we have a sink and a source in this situation. Okay, <clears throat> so now, oh, thank you. No, that's not a wise move. So now maybe let me present you the picture of what happens in the general situation where, apart from the trap set, we have, you know, also, not, 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 not only we have this phenomenon of escape in frequency, but we also have the classical phenomenon of escape in position. And so uh, let me see if I can do this. Uh, T1. Okay. It's a bit hard to draw this picture. Ah, well, I tried. Is it visible? Okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> so I'll talk about this picture, and then I'll talk about tools that actually let, let us prove the estimate that I promised. Okay, I don't see the picture now. Well, so in the picture, what you see is this vertical line. So it's a, I, I drew my thing as a cylinder. And the horizontal two directions are just the base point. So just x, what happens in the x plane. <laughs> so I drew on the left a little bit more in detail what happens for the usual flow in the x plane, for, for the original flow. And so it has this gamma plus, gamma minus in the trapped set. Now if I consider what happens in the xi plane, well, if you take look only over the trapped set, then it's this picture that I drew there. It's just collapsed to one dimensional thing. So this blue line is what we had there, blue vertical line, because over the trapped set. And you have this ES star and the U star like before. But you see that uh, you actually have many more features here because if you look at uh, the outgoing tail, it's foliated by unstable manifolds. And so you can naturally define conormal bundles to these manifolds. Because, well, the manifolds exist, and you, know, you can define the tangent space at each point. So this means that you can extend your dual unstable foliation to gamma plus, to the outgoing tail. Not, 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 none of this stuff is smooth, by the way. Gamma plus, gamma minus, and k original fractal sets. So you have to be somewhat careful about doing this. And so I call this extended bundle E plus star. Similarly, you can extend the dual, uns, uh, the dual stable bundle to be a vector, you know, a, a, a sub bundle of the tangent space over gamma minus. And so I call this E minus star. So th those are these blue lines drawn here and there because they deliver gamma plus, gamma minus, but they only, uh, you know, they, they also fix a specific frequency. So that's why they have a choice in the vertical direction. <clears throat> and then the dynamics of the flow is drawn there. I'm perhaps not going to describe every single trajectory. <laughs> But you can see that there is some kind of saddle point situation happening here because what can happen is uh, if you take a point that, say, lies on gamma plus and is very, very close, you know, and, and, and you propagate it backwards, you most likely will hit the dual unstable manifold there because your base point will converge to K. Now, if you take a point that's just a little bit off, but still very, you know, but still say far from the unstable direction, what it does is it does something like this. So it wants to go to the dual, to the dual stable direction back, but the x variable, because we're not on gamma plus, forces it to escape in the physical space. So in the end, we have this, uh, you know, saddle points instead of, say, sources and sinks. 
You can view E plus star as a sink and E minus star as a source if you wanted to. Okay. A any questions about that picture? Okay. <laughs> All right. So it's, it's just a question of somehow the interplay between the hyperbolic dynamics in the, in the fibers and the hyperbolic dynamics in, in the base. Okay. So now, uh, well, how do we actually prove our estimate? Well, that's where uh, being microlocal somewhat helps because we're not going to be greedy. We're not going to prove this estimate for just, uh, you know, for, for you immediately. What we're going to do is we're going to prove an estimate for a piece of you. So what we can do, so let me see, that should be enough. Uh, mm, as expected. So what we can do is we can prove an estimate of this form. So this looks a bit funny, but just bear with me for a moment. Because I want to write the general form of what estimates will get so that I don't have to rewrite them all the time. So this is, this is just a, this is a, this is a piece of abstract nonsense. I'm just going to use it in different situations. But the kind of estimates that we will have, they will tell me that you can control U when you localize it by pseudo differential operator somewhere in this cotangent bundle by maybe U somewhere else. So it might be conditional control. If you know a norm bound on U somewhere, you get a bound somewhere else, plus the norm of the right hand side, plus an H infinity remainder. So if you control your U everywhere, if you control your U at enough pieces, unconditionally without this B, that, then you're done. Your estimate is done by a partition of unity. And now, what kind of estimates do we know? Well, there is the elliptic estimate, and that's, we don't need any B, but the support of A cannot intersect the energy surface. So this tells me that it's only, you know, we only need to control a function near the energy surface. The next estimate is something called propagation of singularities, and that's due to uh, Hermann during the, uh, in such generality. <coughs> and it's really, it's, it's just a mathematical manifestation of the fact that light propagates, you know, waves at high frequency propagates, propagate along linear trajectories of light. So what you know is that the singularities of your solution will propagate under this flow. So for that, you need this dynamical control condition. If this is the support of A, and this other blob is B not equal to zero, and this thing is the Hamiltonian flow, like that, you need to know that every point on support of A, if you go backwards along the flow, then you eventually hit place where B is not equal to zero, so where we already know a bound in our solution. Now, uh, you might ask, well, maybe you can go forward, but you have to be a bit careful here. That's Basically, choosing the sign of this operator here, choosing the sign of the symbol, restricts the direction of propagation. And luckily, everything is chosen correctly so that we can propagate backward. Or we'll propagate uh, regularity forward, singularity is backward. But of course, if you look at the picture here or a picture there, you see that's not enough. Because, you know, th this set is not empty. So you have to control it somewhere in the set. And this is a conditional estimate. This propagation of singular. Somehow you, you, you just push your problem to a different place. So you need a place to start. And that's where you use a generalization, one could say, of, for example, Melrose's radial estimates. So this is a conditional propagation of singularities, I can say that. And here I'm just going to draw a picture of how this works. So, um, well, let's say I have something like this saddle point situation over there. And now, imagine I want to control my thing, so this is my support of A. And this is the flow again. Now, I put some right-hand side, what I call B. So this is B not equal to zero. 
And I also introduced the set L, which is in the you know, fiber radial compactified cotangent bundle. So this L is compact and invariant under the flow, like this settle point, for example. And the condition that I make, I'll just say it in words because I, I see we're all hungry. You see, this was what? If I start at A and I go backwards, I hit B. This is two conditions. Condition one is if I start at A and I go backwards, either I hit B or I converge to L. Of course, in itself, it's not enough, so this control. Plus, you need a sub-principle symbol condition. Condition on L for this operator P. And that's, if you think about a wave analogy, it's just this, this is going to be a con condition on the imaginary part of the subprincipal symbol. And it just tells me that I have a damping factor, a weak one. So waves that converge to L, they just get dampened. And that's how you can get your estimate. And waves that don't converge to L, they go through B and they're already controlled. That, that's the gist of it. Of course, you, know, you, you need to prove it. And uh, guess what? You use positive commutator. But I'm not going to go into details. So now if we look at this guy, and we'll look at the picture there, how do we prove a general estimate? Well, of course, there are these parts of the picture that went to infinity. They somehow crossed the boundary, and we don't know how this picture ceases to be valid past the boundary. So remember, we embedded our situation to a compact manifold without boundary, and there we killed our vector field somehow. And when we did that, we, we created some other features that I didn't draw there. And together with this estimate and some additional absorbing operators, which are carefully chosen so that your resolvent is not screwed somehow by the addition of these operators, because <coughs> they are no longer compact, you know that you have control on all incoming trajectories. Somehow, if you take a, if you take a point in this phase space, and if the corresponding classical trajectory, if you go backwards, eventually crosses the boundary, you know that you have an estimate there. So, for example, if you had no trapping, you would be done at this point. Now, the next thing you should consider is this point there, ES star. You see that a part of it that comes from infinity, this horizontal part, is already controlled. And so you can get control on ES star itself, on the neighborhood of it, as long as you write this condition, this condition, and what this translates to is it turns out that this condition depends on the Sobolev class, on, on, on the Sobolev exponent of the space in which we want the estimate. And so the condition just translates to that, that our anisotropic Sobolev space near this trajectory has to be isomorphic to a high regularity Sobolev space. So we require high regularity there. And R has to be large enough to outweigh whatever imaginary parts we get in the subprincipal terms, say, from this lambda, or from the fact that our operator was not self-adjoint because you know, there was no invariant measure, smooth invariant measure. So that gives you control on this small piece, and then you can propagate it forward. The zero part is easily handled because we, we put an absorbing term there, so it's basically el el ellipticity helps us there. And then when you arrive to this other guy, you use the same estimate, but again, you will need at this point, which in this case would be EU star. Well, it's not a point, it's a really, it's a, it's a big closed subset. You need to impose again a specific regularity of the space. And there you have to require that your space is negative large enough Sobolev. So that's why your space has to be anisotropic somehow. You, you, you cannot just take high regularity or low regularity. You, you have to really take both in different places. And if you do it correctly, that's where you get your... Uh, that's where you get your bound. So I should say uh, maybe 30 seconds. I'm not going to write anything anymore. But how do you uh, prove theorem 2 from here? It turns out that actually continuing a zeta function here is somewhat straight, well, straightforward, but it's somewhat natural because it turns out that the log derivative of a zeta function is something called a flat trace of the resolvent. And you can prove that your zeta function continues as long as you can prove that you can take a flat trace of this family of operators that you constructed. And that, thanks to Hermander, 
For that, it's just enough to know how singularities in phase space travel. You just have to know that singularities don't intersect the diagonal. And this picture there, together with these estimates, where you can actually put something here as well, this actually tells you exactly where your singularities have to lie. And you see that your singularities are basically just always propagated forward, and they, they never loop in circles. And that's how you know that you can take the flat trace, and this flat trace will give you a meromorphic continuation of the log derivative of the resolvent. OK, uh, sorry for holding you up. Uh, thank you. Your setup then also apply for something like uh, three disk systems or maybe three band potentials? Uh, yes. So as a matter of fact, so Vivian talked uh, in the morning about how difficult billiards are, but those are closed billiards where you have glancing trajectories. For open billiards, uh, I believe that somehow, as long as you have a no eclipse condition, the glancing trajectories never see the trapped set, and this should indeed apply. But we, we, we haven't written it up, so, but yeah, it should apply. And probably also for, for potential, as, as long as, of course, you, know, you have this hyperbolicity. Yeah. 